بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم أما بعد الحديث الحديث السابع عشر عن أبي يعلى شداد بن أوس شداد بن أوس رضي الله عنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله كتب الإحسان على كل شيء فإذا قتلتم فأحسنوا القتلة وإذا ذبحتم فأحسنوا الذبحة وليحد أحدكم شفرة شفرة شفرته وليرح ذبيحته رواه مسلم on the authority of Abu Ya'la Shaddad ibn Aws radiyallahu anhu from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed excellence in all things Thus if you kill, kill in a good manner or kill in an in a excellent condition or if you slaughter, slaughter in a good manner each of you should sharpen his blade and spare suffering to the animal he or she is slaughtering. This hadith is reported by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tawfiq to begin hadith number 17 in the Arba'een of Al-Imam al nawawi And this hadith has a lot of detail, so inshallah ta'ala we will try our best to cover as much as we can in this short amount of time. So this hadith, as I mentioned, has been reported by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi did not narrate this exact hadith. However, he narrated a hadith very similar in meaning. The exact same meaning, but slight different wording. Like so, Imam Tabarani, he has also narrated this hadith with a slight variation in wording. However, every single one of these narrations have one meaning. They all have the same meaning. So before we get into the actual hadith, Shaddad ibn Aws anhu is the narrator of this hadith. So usually I like to go into the narrator or narrators of the hadith. So today I would like to speak about this Sahabi who is narrating this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Shaddad ibn Aws. Now Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu, he's a very, he comes from a very noble family. His father was a Sahabi. His uncle was also a very famous Sahabi. So his father's name was Aus, obviously. Shaddad ibn Aus ibn Thabit ibn al Mundir. So his father's name was Aus ibn Thabit. Al Ansari, he was from the Ansar, from Medina Munawwara. Al Khazraji, because he was from the tribe of Banu Khazraj. And his kunya is Abu Ya'la, the father of Ya'la. Why? Because his oldest son. His name was Ya'la. And one very interesting point to make, he was the nephew of the very famous Sahabi, Hassan ibn Thabit. And Hassan, radiallahu anhu, he was the poet, the sha'ir of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's very famously known for mentioning very, and reciting very beautiful poetry about the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. There's an actual book called the Diwan, the Diwan of Hassan. The Diwan of Hassan ibn Thabit, it's a compilation of all of Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu's poetry. And indeed he was a, he was a master of poetry. And Imam Dhabi rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned this. Who is Sha'ir Rasulullah. So Shaddad was the nephew of this great Sahabi. So as I mentioned, his father was also a Sahabi. He became Muslim at a very young age, he was a young teen, a young adult, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina. And when the Prophet alayhi wa sallam came to Al-Madinah al-Munawwara, he had the habit of always, or he had this, uh, he made this um, rule where he would pair one muhajir with one ansari. He would pair them together. So that those people who migrated from Mecca, they had support in Medina. So, Shaddad ibn Aws being an Ansari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa interestingly enough, he paired him with a very great man, with a very noble Sahabi. And this pair actually, this pairing of him to this great man really 
really emphasized and showed what type of person he was going to become later on in life. So Shaddad ibn Aws, he was paired with the great Sahabi Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Uthman ibn Affan, we all, we all obviously know who he is. He is the third Khalifa in Islam. He was a very close companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a man of haya. He was a man of humility, a man of being humble, subhanAllah, very great individual. So Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu was paired with him. So Shaddad radiallahu anhu, he had five kids. He had one daughter whose name was Khazraj and he had four boys. The oldest, as I said, his name was Ya'la, another by the name of Muhammad, another by the name of Abdul Wahhab, and the last, the youngest, by the name of Mundir. So some say that Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu, he was a Badri, meaning he took place in the battle of Badr. However, this is not the, this is not the correct opinion. His father was a Badri. His father took place in the Battle of Badr. However, Shaddad radiallahu anhu did not take place in the Battle of Badr. He took place in the Battle of Uhud. And this was the same battle that the father of Shaddad radiallahu anhu became martyred in. He died in the Battle of Uhud. So Shaddad was very young when his father radiallahu anhu passed away. He was in his, you know, a young, barely reached 20 years old. He was a late, a late teen. So when his father passed away, radiallahu anhum, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam noticed that Shaddad, he was, you know, in a state of grief. You know, it's tough for a person that at such a young age to lose a mother or a father. It's not easy, especially at that age where, you know, you're transitioning from becoming a young adult to an adult. It's very difficult when you don't have a mother or father there. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to Shaddad, he said, Ya Shaddad, Malik, what's wrong? What's wrong with Shaddad? Shaddad radiallahu anhu, he said, Baqat bi ad-dunya. And his answer, subhanAllah, is a very interesting answer. Shaddad said that this world has become very, very restricted on me. My chest has become very confined and restricted. It's become very heavy on me. And it's interesting because youngsters, people who are young, you know, they sometimes like to exaggerate their problems. Is sometimes people like to, especially younger people, you know, a teenager, something small happens in their life, but sometimes they like to exaggerate it like it's, you know, the end of the world. Like, oh man, this happened. This is, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me in, in my life. And they over exaggerate. So Shaddad radiallahu anhu, he was not over exaggerating here because he had actually lost his father. So he said, Daqad bi ad dunya. The dunya has become very confined and restricted on me, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he consoled him. He said, Ya Shaddad, Laysa alayk, don't worry. He said, don't worry, Ya Shaddad. Inna shama yuftah wa yuftahu baytul maqdis fatakoon anta wa waladuka a'immatan feehim insha'Allah ta'ala. So Rasulullah ﷺ, he consoled him and he, he gave him a prophecy. He said, don't worry. In the future, the area of Sham, of Syria, is going to be conquered. And like so, Palestine, Bayt al-Maqdis, will also be conquered. And you and your family will be imams and leaders in that area, insha'Allah ta'ala. So don't worry. Right now, it may seem like the world is restricted around you. Right now, it may seem that you're very depressed and sad. But one day, you will be, insha'Allah ta'ala, a leader of those areas, of those places. So the Prophet, alayhi wassalam, gave him a prophecy. And you know, subhanAllah, the Prophet, alayhi wassalam, giving a young man like that, Consolment tells a lot about how, what kind of person he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. In today's day and age, when we see a youngster, when we see someone who's young, you know, in a, in a bad mood or upset or sad, we never think to ask them if something is wrong. We never go to them and ask them, like, hey, is everything okay? But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being the type of person he was, he went to Shaddad. Not only, not only did he ask him what's wrong, but he also consoled him. And he said, you know, don't worry. It's going to be okay. And this is something we should also bring into our lives. When we see somebody going through a lot, going through struggles in life, console them. Be good to them. You know, remind them that, you know, this, this dunya is short. Remind them that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves somebody, He tests them. The Prophet ﷺ said. 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves somebody, He puts them through tests. So it's an alama, it's a sign of Allah's love. So this was the akhlaq and the demeanor of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And I mentioned how he, he was paired with Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was a man of hilm and patience. He had a lot of sabr. And this is one of the reasons to why Shaddad radiallahu anhu also gained this quality of hilm and sabr. So Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he narrates a, a, a narration. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, he said, Abu Darda, Abu Darda, he was also a very famous Sahabi who was based later on in Sham. He moved to Syria later on in his life. So he said about Shaddad, he said, Inna Shaddad ibn Aus utiya ilman wa hilman. Now Shaddad radiallahu anhu, he has both ilm, knowledge, and hilm, patience. But the narration is quite long. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu actually said that, you know, most people, some people have ilm, some people have knowledge, but they have no hilm. They have no patience. But on the contrary, some people have hilm, some people have patience, but they have no knowledge. So Shaddad was one of those people who had both. He had hilm and ilm. And whenever he spoke, this is why um, uh, uh, Saeed ibn Abdul Aziz, he mentioned something. He says, Fadula Shaddad ibn Aus bi khaslatain. Now Shaddad ibn Aus, he was blessed with two great qualities. One of those qualities was what? Bibayanin ida nataq. Whenever he spoke, he spoke with clarity. Whenever he spoke, people listened to him. Whenever he spoke, his words touched people's hearts. He was that type of man because of his hilm. And that's the thing. When a person, when a person has hilm, you know, ilm is, ilm is one thing. You know, a person can be very knowledgeable. But if a person has no akhlaq with that ilm, you know, their ilm, is, their ilm is, is fruitless. Their ilm is going to be fruitless. And like so, if a person has hilm but no ilm, their words aren't going to go very far. But when these two things come together, a person's words have huge effects and meanings. A person's, word touch, a person's words can touch a person's heart this way. So Shaddad had these two qualities, ilm and hilm. And the second quality that Saeed ibn, ibn Abdul Aziz says that he was obviously a man. When he spoke, he spoke with clarity. And the second, whenever he would get angry, he would, cons he would hold back his anger. Whenever he would get angry, he would control his anger. He would never let his anger take over. So, I mean, we spoke about anger last week and how, I mean, how the different types of angers work and so forth. So I don't want to get too much into it, but Shaddad ibn Aus was this type of person. Radiallahu anhu. And um, going to the, uh, back to the concept of suhba, you know, it's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's as mentioned in the past, that al-mar'u ala deeni khalil. That a person, an individual, he's going to be on the religion of his, his friend or her friend. So Uthman radiallahu anhu being so close to Shaddad, his qualities... His qualities kind of wore off on Shaddad ibn Aus. That is why they say that if you want to change your life, if you want to change your life, be amongst the Salihin. Be amongst the righteous. Sooner or later, eventually, their sulh, their sulh, their piety will rub off onto you. Their piety will rub off onto you. So this is, this is a great example of how one person's qualities were transferred to another because of his suhba and how much time he spent with him. So one of his students, he speaks about the zuhad, the zuhad, a zahid is a person who has no love for dunya. The English word is, he's an ascetic. He has no love for dunya. So the student mentions that zuhad al-ansari tharatha, Imam Dhabi mentions this, this narration. He says, the zuhad, the ascetic people, the people who have no love for dunya amongst the Ansar are three. There are three people from the Ansar. The first is who? Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. The second, Umayr ibn Sa'id. Umayr ibn Sa'id. And the third, Shaddad ibn Aws. So Shaddad was amongst those people who his, his mentality was akhirah. His goal was akhirah. Nothing else concerned him. And we're going to see what this next example, subhanAllah, I mean, when I read this, I was just blown away. His student narrates that, 
Whenever he would get into bed, whenever he would go to bed at nighttime to sleep, whenever he would lay down, he would always be moving back and forth. He would always be restless. He would never fall asleep. He was never able to sleep. And then when he would, he would wake up, فيقول, Allahumma, inna nara adhabat minni an, an nawm. He said, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, thinking about Jahannam has made my sleep go away. Ya Allah, thinking about the fire, thinking about the adhab has made me, has, has given me insomnia. I can't sleep at night just by thinking about the adhab, just by thinking about Jahannam. He would be restless. And then his student mentions, فَيَقُومُ فَيُصَلِّ حَتَّى يُصْبِحْ so what he would do was every single night when there was, this would happen, he would stand up and he would start praying the entire night. Hatta yusbih, until the, 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 fajr, the fajr light would come in in the morning. So this person, Shaddad ibn Aws, I mean, just by thinking about akhirah, just by thinking about the adab, just by thinking about the fire, his sleep would go away. His mentality and his, his connection to akhirah was very, was very strong. I mean, in today's day and age, we have so many reminders how much we read about the Akhirah, how much we read about Jahannam, how many speeches have we heard about Jahannam, the fire is like this, the punishment, the punishment's like this, but to no effect. I mean, a lot of us, it doesn't even, it doesn't even make our hearts shake anymore. But these people, just by thinking about these things, let alone somebody giving them advice, let alone them listening to a speech, just by them thinking about it, it would be restless. Always contemplating, always thinking about the Akhirah. And again, he was a man who whenever he would speak, people would listen. So one day he was amongst a group of Sahaba and his students. He said, الناس, He says, oh people, you know, indeed the most, the, the, the thing that I'm scared for the most the thing that I fear for you the most is that which the Prophet ﷺ told me. And what is that? al khafiya desires and shirk. So then the people were very confused. The Sahaba who were there and the students were very confused. They said, yeah, Shaddad, you know, we understand desires, obviously. Human beings, we're always inclined towards our desires. And we have to fight off our desires. We understand this. But he said, shirk? His students were confused and the Sahaba were confused. They said, you know, we're all, alhamdulillah, we're all Muslims, we're all mu'min, we believe in Allah, we believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the final messenger. We have never committed shirk in our life. So how can you say that you fear shirk for us? And his words, so then they asked, Fama had a shirk. what is this shirk that you fear for us, O Shaddad? Because we're Muslim, obviously we're not mushriks. Then he said, Faqal, then he narrates a hadith, Faqal al Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man salla yura'i he says the Prophet in this hadith was mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. He says that the Prophet told me that whoever prays, and while he's praying, he's showing off. He's praying to show the people around him that he's praying. He's praying to show the people that, hey, I'm a good Muslim, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. This person has committed shirk. Then he went on and he says, Whoever fasts, whoever fasts and his intention is to show the people around him that, hey, I'm fasting because I'm this and I'm fasting because I'm that. Then this person has also committed shirk. He's associating that action to somebody else when that action is only supposed to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he goes on, he says, And whoever donates and gives sadaqa, showing off to the people around him that, hey, I'm giving this much money, this person has committed shirk. So this was a piece of advice he gave the sahaba and the tabi'een of his time. In the era we're living in today, we see this a lot. Where, I mean, there's a lot of, one example that I see a lot especially, is, um, you know, when, when a person wants to get married, and I've seen this example a lot. Let's just say one family is going and proposing to another family. The boy's family is going proposing to the girl's family. So this boy, this boy, he makes it the habit now to go to the masjid every single day 
to go to the same masjid the girl's father goes to every single day to show him that, hey, I'm at the masjid. To show him that, hey, I'm praying at the masjid. There's a lot of examples like this today. You know, before the habit wasn't there to go to the masjid, but now the habit comes, why? To show the father of this girl you want to marry that, hey, I'm at the masjid all the time now. So where is your, where is your intention? Is your intention for this father? Or is your intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Shaddad ibn Aus narrated this hadith that this is a type of shirk. So whenever we're doing an action, be very careful who you're doing it for. And that is why I always say we should always have a dhakhira, a storage of a'mal and actions that nobody knows except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That nobody sees except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the best types of actions. The actions that no eyes have seen except your, except your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I emphasize everybody, myself first, have a dhakhira. Have a dhakhira, have a storage for the yawm, for yawm al-qiyamah that nobody knows except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the types of a'mal that have the most ikhlas and the most sincerity. And these are the a'mal that are going to have the most, you can say the highest, the most weight on the mizan on yawm al-qiyamah. So this was the advice of Shaddad ibn Aus towards his, towards his uh, companions. So one day Shaddad ibn Aus, he was giving a khutbah. And I mentioned how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that, you know, one day Sham and Palestine are going to be conquered. The Prophet alayhi wa said that you and your family are going to be leaders. In the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu made Shaddad ibn Aus the governor of Hims. Now Hims is a city in modern day Syria. So Shaddad became the governor of this area. And um, so obviously he used to give khutbahs. He used to give nasiha. So one day he was giving, giving a khutbah. And his khutbah, again, his words were all to do with just how, how, how worthless this dunya is. And how akhirah, how akhirah should be our main objective. He said, Ayyuha nas inna dunya ajalun hadir. Ya'kulu minha al-barru wal fajr. This dunya is present in front of you. This dunya is present, it's right here in front of you. The fajr, the sinner, and the good person, and the, and the believer, they all consume from it. They all take benefit from it, equally, in, 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 uh, with, without any harm. They all take benefit from it. Benefit is equal for all of them. Then he goes and he says, Then he says, however, akhirah is a delayed timing. It is a delayed and deferred time. Then he goes and he says, يَحْكُمُ فِيهَا مَلِكٌ قَادِرٌ This is the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge every single one of us. Then he goes and he says, أَلَا وَإِنَّ الْخَيْرَ كُلَّهُ بِحَذَافِيرِهِ بِحَذَافِيرِهِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّ الشَّرَّ كُلَّهُ بِحَذَافِيرِهِ فِي النَّعْ And he says, indeed, all good, all good is all the good, is whatever good is inside Jannah. All good is whatever Jannah has, and all bad is whatever Jahannam has. This is what good and this is what bad is. Jannah, work for Jannah, work for Jannah. We all have responsibilities in life. We all have aspirations of dunya and so forth. No one's saying not to chase them, but have some balance. Have some balance with akhirah and dunya. This is what's, what's very important. So Shaddad ibn Aus, after being the governor of Hims, he left the position later on and he moved to Palestine. He moved to Palestine. And that was where he passed away. He passed away in Palestine in the year 58 or some say in the year 64 after Hijrah. He narrated about over 50 ahadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhu ajma'i. So now the actual hadith. This hadith It's very interesting. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Inna allaha kataba al-ihsan. The, the verb kataba is used. Now kataba in Arabic literally means to write. Kitaba, to write something down. However, it's translated as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made fard and obliged you. He has made it fard upon you. Allah has made what fard? He has made ihsan towards everything fard upon you. So now why is the word kataba used here? Kataba alaykum. 
So we see that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this verb to show wujub, to show that something is fard. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about siyam, he says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam. Fasting has been made fard for you, has been ordained upon you, has been decreed for you. Kutiba is used. And then in the famous ayah, in the salat kanat adal mu'minina kitaba mawquta. Indeed, salah has what? It made, has been decreed upon you. Kitab and at a decreed and far time for you. Kitab is used again. And the, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regards to the qiyam of Ramadan, of, of taraweeh. When he told the people, he said, Inni khashitu ay yuktaba alaykum. I'm scared. Inni khashitu, I fear ay yuktaba. Kataba again is used. Ay yuktaba alaykum. I'm scared that it's going to be made far for you. That is why I stopped you from coming and joining me in salah. So kataba, kataba. This is a word that has been used for fardiya and for wujub. Yaqtadil wujub. So now, these are some examples of this verb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in surah, <coughs> He says in surah al-Nahl, Inna allaha ya'muru bil-adli wal-ihsan. So now, ihsan. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to be just, adl, and to have ihsan. This is ayah number 90 of Surah Al-Nahl. So now, is ihsan fard? This is the question now. Is ihsan towards everything fard? Because I said that kataba is used to show that something is fard. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he says, Inna Allah ya'muru, Allah has commanded you with ihsan. So now what is the hukum of ihsan? There's two types of ihsan. So taratan yakunu lil wujub. Sometimes ihsan, sometimes ihsan comes in the meaning of necessity and wujub. Meaning you must have ihsan for so and so thing. Okay? So for example, towards what? Towards your parents. Having ihsan towards your parents is a fard. Having ihsan towards family members is a fard. Having ihsan towards your neighbor or your guest is a fard. However, sometimes Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he says, taratan yakunu lin nudb. Sometimes ihsan is for what? It's for an action that's desired and, and preferred. It's not fard, but it's mustahab. It's good if you do it. Like what? Like giving sadaqah, giving charity. It's not fard for you to give charity, but it's what? It's mustahab. It's good for you to give charity. So these are the two, the two types of ihsan. One is for wujub, one is for istihbab, for nudb. So now, this hadith is very technical. So I want everyone to bear with me here. So the thing is, when, one wants, when, when somebody wants to implement ihsan, there should be no shortage of any option. When somebody wants to bring ihsan into their life, there should be no shortage of how to make their life better. Everything we, we are doing in life, every action in life, there's something we can do to make that action better. In terms of, every, when I mean everything, I mean everything. Because this hadith is telling us what? Ihsan ala kulli shay, ihsan for everything. So, the way we eat, the way we eat, we can always eat in a more respectable and better fashion closer to the sunnah. The way we walk, we can always walk with more humility. The way we sleep, we can always sleep more accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The way we speak to somebody, we can always speak to somebody in a more respectful manner. So ihsan has no, has no limit. That's the point I'm trying to make. Ihsan has no limit. And if ihsan has no limit, we should, we should not limit ourselves to being better. We should always push ourselves to be better in everything we do. This is what this hadith is telling us. So now, Ibn Sa'di, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says something interesting. He says, مِنْ أَجَلِّ أَنْوَاعِ الْإِحْسَانِ الْإِحْسَانُ إِلَى مَنْ أَسَاءَ إِلَيْكِ He says the most hardest type of ihsan, the most difficult type of ihsan is what? Is to have ihsan towards those people who have harmed you and towards those people who have hurt you. This is the most difficult type of ihsan. Because people who hurt us, 
people who say something to us, whether it's verbal, whether it's, whether it's physical, the first thing that comes to our mind is what? Us, you know, us retaliating. Intiqam, us taking revenge. The last thing that comes to our mind is for us to be good to them. That's the last thing that comes to our mind. But this is, this is the most noble. Min ajal. Ibn Sa'adi Sa says, Min ajal. This is the most noble type of ihsan. To be good to even those people who have harmed you. Even if it's a smile. Even if it's a smile. Even if, if it's us saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And this goes back to the ayah in Surah Fussilat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, He says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةِ إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةً كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ He says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةِ Good and bad, they are not equal. Then He says, إدفع بالتي هي أحسن. He says, respond to evil, respond to evil towards you in a better fashion. Respond to that person in a better fashion than the evil they have responded to you with. Respond in a better manner. Even if they have harmed you, even if they have hurt you, even if they have said something to, you know, to shed a tear, respond with something good. Then he goes and he says, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةَ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ he says, you know, that feud, then the one who you are in feud with, you know, if you respond in a good manner, one day they will be a close friend to you. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying. That person who you have a feud with, that person who you have a quarrel with, by you showing ihsan towards them, one day they will, they will be a very close friend to you. Because they will see that, hey, I harmed this person. I hurt this person, I hit this person, I swore at this person, but still after everything, he is still smiling at me. He or she is still smiling at me. He or she is still treating me in a good fashion. This person is a really good person, I wanna be close to them. If anything, they will come and apologize to you. So this is the most noble, yet the most difficult type of ihsan. May Allah give us all tawfiq to bring this quality into our lives. So now, the word in the hadith here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَإِذَا ذَبَحْتُمْ وَإِذَا فَإِذَا قَتَلْتُمْ فَأَحْسِنِ الْقِتْلَةِ When you kill something, kill it in a good manner. Kill it in an excellent manner. Now, when, when somebody first reads this, or when somebody first hears this, it sounds like an oxymoron, or it sounds like a contradiction. When you kill something, kill something in a good manner. How does that make any sense? Or the next part of the hadith, when you slaughter something, when you slaughter an animal, slaughter it in an excellent condition. How do you slaughter something in an excellent condition? Or how do you kill something in an excellent condition? So now, the word qitla and dhibha is used. Now, the beautiful thing about the Arabic language is whenever you see a scale or a wazan, when you put the verb on that scale, it will give an entire different meaning. Okay, so for example, if you put something on the scale of fi'latun, like qitlatun and dhibhatun, it refers to the manner and condition of that verb. So what does Rasulullah actually say in this hadith? When you kill, فَإِذَا قَتَلْتُمْ فَأَحْسِنِ الْقِتْلَ Make sure you are, the manner you are killing, the manner you are slaughtering is good. So it's the manner, it's the quality we're doing the action that Rasulullah is, is emphasizing. The hay'ah, the hal, the condition of how it's being done. So now, what does this mean to, to kill or slaughter in an excellent manner? So now, there's guidelines to everything. There are guidelines to everything. We spoke about the rule, we spoke about the hadith where Rasulullah spoke about war, how the, what the intention of war should be and when a person goes for war and so forth. So this hadith, this first part, the second part of this hadith, when you kill, kill in a good manner, kill in a method that is accepted, this has to do with the, with the rulings of war. So I'm not going to get too deep into it because we spoke about it. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this hadith is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. He says, لا تمثلوا ولا تقتلوا وليدا. So the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, whenever he would send out an army towards battle, he would give them advice. He would advise them. So one of the advices he would give 
would be what? لا تمثل Do not mutilate. Do not cut up anything. When you're killing somebody, when you're going for battle, do it swiftly. Do not mutilate anybody. Have respect to the way you're killing somebody. Don't be inhumane. Don't be barbaric. Then you go and he said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ وَلِيدَ And do not kill any kids. Do not kill any children. This is obviously the rules of battle, the rules of war. When you're going for war, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited what? Killing old people, killing women, and killing children. So that's one thing. But the manner of how these battles used to be taken place. The Prophet ﷺ did not want the Sahaba to go to fight in a very barbaric, bar 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 barbaric manner and just, you know, cut up everything they see or this and that. There's adab to even this as well. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what did he say? لا تمثلوا Do not mutilate. Do not cut up people. You know, in today's day and age, especially, subhanAllah, the past few years, the different types of chemical bombs that are being thrown in Syria are towards the, the children of Palestine. I mean, when these bombs fall on these people, the type of damage it does. And some people, unfortunately, they share these images on, on social media. And it's just heartbreaking. You see kids on the ground whose arms are ripped off, whose feet are blown into pieces, who's this and who's that. I mean, this is, this is the reality. We have become so desensitized to this. It doesn't even bother us anymore. Or what's going on today in China to our brothers and sisters in China. How they're being held in concentration camps. They're being held in camps. They're being tortured. They're being force-fed pork. They're being force-fed alcohol. Our Muslim sisters, you know, they're not allowed to wear modest dresses. They're not allowed to wear modest clothing. We're completely desensitized to these things. As Muslims, these things should affect us. And as Muslims, we should actually speak out, speak out against these things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. So that is to do with war. I don't want to get into the battle, the, the rules of war. The hadith, I want, the actual topic I want to stick to today is actually the, the concept of, of, uh, of slaughtering an animal. So now we're going to get, get into the rules of you know, what, what, what's the difference between tayyib and halal? We spoke about tayyib and halal in the past and how, um, how meat, you know, when an animal, for example, is, um, is beat up or tortured and you slaughter it, it's going to be halal, but it's not going to be tayyib anymore and how we should always strive for halal or strive for tayyib. So the next part of the hadith is going to be about this. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, the hadith is mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. He says, مَن مَثَّلَ بِذِي رُوحٍ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُبْ مَثَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He says, whoever mutilates, whoever chops up and mutilates anything that has a ruh, this includes animals, whoever mutilates anything that has a ruh and he does not do tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut him up and mutilate him on يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ so this is even to do with animals. It's encompassing of everything. Having ihsan towards animals. And it's general. Anything that has a soul. Animals all have ruhs. Animals have arwah. So this hadith is very am and very general. So much so Imam Ahmad, he brings different narrations talking about a fish. He says, لا يشوى السمك في النار وهو حي A fish should not be thrown into the fire while being, it's, while it being alive. A fish should not be thrown into boiling water while it's alive. And Umm Darda radiallahu anhu, she says, Nahat Umm Darda an tahrik al burghuthi bin nar. So Umm Darda radiallahu anhu, and all these ahadith are mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, book of Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. He said, Umm Darda radiallahu anhu used to stop people from what? Burning fleas. Burning ticks, you know, sometimes people have fleas or ticks on their head or sometimes animals have fleas that causes the irritation or an itch. People used to burn them. So Umm Darda radiallahu even forbid this. You're not allowed to burn anything. No living creature. So this goes to the, to the, to the concept of, or this actually does ishara to another hadith. This hadith has also been narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Radiallahu anhu, he reports this. He says, Kunna ma'an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fa mamaradna biqarriyati namlin qad uhriqat, 
فغضب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إنه لا ينبغي لبشر أن يعذر بعذاب الله عز وجل So Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he says, one day we were walking with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we walked by a colony of ants, like an ant hole or an ant hill, they say, right? We walked by an ant hill and this ant hill was on fire. Somebody burnt this colony of ants. So what, what happened? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? فَغَضِبَ He became very, very angry and upset. فَغَضِبَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He says, it is, nobody is allowed to do this. No human being is ever allowed to punish anything like this with fire. Because this is a punishment, what? He says, لا يعذب بعذاب الله This is a punishment on, on يوم القيامة that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in akhirah, in the fire, in Jahannam is going to punish his, his people or his, uh, those disobedient slaves with. It's a punishment specific to Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam forbid burning anything. And this goes to the masala of crab and lobster. So now according to the Ahnaf, regardless, according to the Hanafis, crab and lobster is haram. Or makru tahrimi. We can't say it's haram, but it's makru tahrimi, according to the Hanafis. But according to the Shawafi and the Malikiya, crab and lobster is halal. Crab and lobster is halal. I don't want to get into the, into the proofs and dala'il, but let's just say we're going to take the opinion of Imam Malik and Imam Shafi. Crab and lobster is halal. How is lobster and crab prepared in today's day and age? A lot of the times, they're just thrown, while being alive, they're thrown into boiling water. While being alive. Torturing them. So this type, some, if this happens, this meat will now be makru for us to eat. This is even according to the Malikiya in the, in the Shawafiya. So again, if we're going to do things, if we're going to, cook food or whatever it is, whether it's a fish, whether it's lobster, whether it's shrimp, make sure we're not making them suffer. We should not make them suffer. Do it in a very humane fashion. Especially when it comes to burning and cooking things and boiling things, we should be very, very careful because this is a clear prohibition the Prophet made. And again, this separates between halal and tayyib. So now if a lobster or a, if a lobster or a crab is thrown into boiling water while being alive, it's going to be halal, no doubt. Is it going to be tayyib? It's not going to be tayyib. Now, there's a difference between halal and tayyib, right? It's going to be permissible for us to eat, but that, that aspect and that quality of it being completely 100% pure tayyib is going to be removed from it. So we have to be very careful with these things. Or another hadith where the Prophet, alayhi and this is, this is for those people who... Um, who have, you know, who, who like dogs or cats or whatever it is. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prohibited people, he prohibited people from what? From jailing and uh, you can say, um, from caging animals. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited people from caging animals. You know, some people I've seen, they have dogs inside or in their backyard. Some people have dogs in their backyard. Or some people don't even have a backyard. They have like a little mini dog house and the dog is there the entire day. They don't let it out. They don't do anything with it. The Prophet ﷺ forbid this. You're actually torturing this animal. Or for example, in today's day and age, we have, you know, with, with lions and tigers, aside from that, with, with killer whales and dolphins. A killer whale, I mean, look at, look at, the, look at, look at a whale's natural habitat. The ocean is its natural habitat. How vast is the ocean? Killer whales travel thousands and thousands of miles and kilometers daily. Yet we're going to limit them and put them inside a small swimming pool? What type of dhulm are we doing to these animals? What type of mental, I mean, emotional abuse are we putting these animals through? The Prophet ﷺ forbid this. Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, now we're going to get into the animals you know, that we can actually eat. Abdullah ibn Umar, he was once walking by, a, he was walking by a, a group of people. And these people, they tied up a chicken and they were throwing spears and shooting arrows at it while it was being alive. They were shooting it with arrows and they were throwing spears at it while being alive. So Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, Man hada? Who did this? He was very upset. He said, who did this? And he said, in the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la'ana man fa'ala hada. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has cursed the person who has done this. 
He has cursed those people who do things like this. Torturing animals. This hadith was narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. Or another thing where people like to prize hunting. Prize hunting. Some people like to go out, and especially in, in Canada, it's very popular to go uh, fox hunting or wolf hunting. They like to go hunt animals, and I mean, they just, they kill it and they just, they let it be. They leave it there to suffer and die. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he has completely forbidden this as well. The Prophet ﷺ forbid what? Forbid taking those things that have souls and just and going hunting and just killing it for no reason. So prize hunting is forbidden in Islam. But but this is different than the concept of, of hunting animals that are halal to eat. That's different. We're allowed to go and hunt animals that are halal to eat, like deer, you know, moose, elk, and these types of things, rabbit. I mean, some people eat rabbit. I've never tried it. I've always wanted to, but apparently rabbit's really good. So these things, for us to go and hunt them, for us to go hunt them with a gun or with an arrow, it's halal. Okay, but there's, con there's some conditions to it. So now, what are the conditions? The, the muftis have given different conditions. So the first thing is what? Before you shoot your gun or before you let go of your arrow, you must say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must say tasmiyah. Whether it's bismillah, Allahu akbar, this is, saying the name of Allah is the bare minimum. There's many duas to read when you're slaughtering an animal and so forth, but the bare minimum is what? Just saying the name of Allah. Some ulama even say that, you know, it's permissible just by you saying subhanallah or alhamdulillah or bismillah. Just mention the name of Allah, this is the condition before you shoot the gun or let go of the arrow. The second condition is what? Once the animal is shot, one should go in pursuit of the animal to slaughter it. You should immediately go and slaughter it. But now the question is, what if that, what if that animal is dead? What if by you shooting the animal, it has passed away? So now the, if the animal is found alive, it should be slaughtered. If the animal is dead on arrival, it would be deemed halal. It would be halal. But provided what? If the animal died due to the wound afflicted and the loss of blood. If the animal died because of you shooting it and it died because the blood came out of that wound, then it'll be halal for you to eat. But if you shot that animal with an arrow or with a gun or whatever it is and it fell off a cliff or it died because of this reason, it will not be halal for you to eat it anymore. So this is specific with hunting. So now we can go and hunt animals, but we can only go and hunt animals if we're going to go and eat them. We can't go and hunt animals if we're just going to go kill them for fun and let them suffer after that. That is impermissible. So this is to do with hunting. So now we get into the adab of slaughtering an animal. There is adab to slaughtering an animal. So there's one hadith that's mentioned in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he walked by a person, he walked by a man. And he saw that this man was dragging a sheep by its ears. يجرر, he, was just, he was just dragging it. Shatan bi udunihi. He's pulling it and, this, and so forth. So the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? He said, udunah, udunah. Let go of its ears. Don't pull it by its ears. Don't do that. Wa bisa lif, lifatiha. Let go of its ears. Don't pull by its ears. Rather, pull it by its neck or push it by its neck. Because that's, gonna, that's not going to do as much damage or pain. That's not going to cause pain as much as a person would do if they're pulling it by its ear. So there's adab to this. When a person is slaughtering an animal, take consideration for the animal you're slaughtering. Don't just go and pick it up and just huck it. I've seen people, <laughs> they pick up sheep and, and lambs and they just throw it against the wall. And I mean, and even then, like they're slaughtering animals in the presence of other animals. They're slaughtering animal while there's other, other animals there present and watching. This is completely against the sunnah. So the, the, another narration on this topic specifically is hadith mentioned in Tabarani. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed by a man and he saw this guy. He had his foot on top of a sheep. He had his foot on top of the sheep. And while, his foot, while the sheep was underneath his feet, he was sharpening his knife right in front of the animal. He was sharpening his knife. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, أَفَلَا قَبْلَ هَذَا تُرِيدُ أَن تُمِيتَهَا مَوْتَاتِ He said, 
have you ever have you not ever done anything like that? Have you ever have, have you never done this before? What's wrong with you? Do you want to kill this animal more than once? You're gonna slaughter it. Why are you why are you torturing it by showing it that you're you know I'm gonna kill you right now? Here's my knife. I'm gonna don't do that. But the Prophet Ali mentioned that only bring out the knife right before you're gonna slaughter the animal. Only bring out the knife right before you're gonna slaughter the animal. Don't show the animal you're gonna slaughter it. Here's the knife and don't have a line where you're showing the animals that, that you know, you're going to be next. You're going to get slaughtered next. This is against the sunnah. And this is, there, there's one narration by Ibn, As, Ibn Asbat. He talks about animals and how animals, you know, they have feelings. He says something interesting. He says, Animals you know, people can say whatever they want about animals. But there's two things that animals recognize. Animals, they recognize who their, who their Rabb is. They recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what? They fear death. These are two things animals can, can, can comprehend. They recognize Allah and they fear death. So if they fear death, if they fear death and we're here, you know, showing them the knife and showing them that, you know, you're gonna, showing, them that, showing them an animal before them that's been slaughtered and doing this and that, how are they going to feel? So Islam considers the feelings of the animal here. Islam considers the feelings of the animal here. Other narrations mention that the knife, the knife you slaughter with must be very, very sharp. You cannot slaughter an animal with a dull knife. If you do slaughter with a dull knife, that concept and that, that, that quality of it being tayyib will be removed. It will not be tayyib anymore. It will be halal, but will it be tayyib? You see these small things these small things and other narrations, subhanAllah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what a man he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One narration mentions that before you slaughter an animal, bring some water for it. Give it some water. Give it some comfort. Give it some raha and some ease. SubhanAllah. What other deen and millah preaches these types of things? You look in modern day slaughterhouses today, Astaghfirullah, I mean the way they slaughter cows and chickens is just completely barbaric. There's a line of cows and each cow sees the other cow in front of them being slaughtered. And not even slaughtered normally. A saw comes and just quickly chops off their, rips their head off. Right in front of these other animals. Is this, is this humane? This is barbaric. So now, this is to do with the adab of slaughtering an animal. This is the etiquette. Now, what are the conditions? What makes an animal halal to eat? So now, there are three conditions. There are three conditions that make an animal halal to eat. The first is what? The person who is slaughtering the animal must be a Muslim or Ahlul Kitab. Must be a Muslim or Ahlul Kitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُ الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ In Surah Ma'idah, the second ayah 6, he says this. That the food of the Ahlul Kitab, the meat of the Ahlul Kitab are halal for you. So this is the first condition. But again, we can't just look at one condition and run with it. A lot of people, what they do, they get this first condition and they just run with it. They ignore the whole concept of tasmiyah, the name of Allah being recited and honored and so forth. The second condition, the veins must be cut with a sharp object. So now there's a small ikhtilaf. What veins and what must be cut? What veins must be cut? Majority of the ulama, they say that four veins must be cut. The two jugular veins, the hulqum, meaning the windpipe, and the esophagus. These four pipes must be cut. Other ulama say that only two must be cut. Regardless, all of them have, all of them have ijma and consensus on what? Blood must be gushing and flowing out when you do cut. Blood must gush out and flow when you cut the animal, when you slaughter the animal. This is a requisite. This is part of it. So this is the second condition. The third condition is what? Tasmiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly in the Quran. Very clearly in the Quran. He says what? It's mentioned in Surah, Surah Al-An'am, verse 121. وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ do not eat from those things which the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not mentioned. وَإِنَّهُ لَفِسْقِ If you do, this is fisk. And what does fisk mean? Fisk literally 
It means an open sin. You're advertising your sin. And you look into the tafsir of this ayah. You look into the tafsir of this ayah, every single mufassir, whether every single tabi'i, they say that what? This has to do with dhabh, while you're slaughtering an animal. Because some people like to take this ayah, again, this is people of, of ignorance. They like to take this ayah and they say, oh, this verse only has to do with when you're about to eat something. This verse only has to do with when you're about to eat something, you should say bismillah. But this verse, this verse is specific to dhabh, slaughtering an animal. طيب. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in a hadith that's mentioned in the jami' of Imam Tirmidhi, he says, مَا أَنْهَرَ الدَّمْ وَذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فَكُلُوهُ Whatever animal has, has had its blood flown, meaning whatever animal has had its blood come out of it, and whatever animal, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioned upon it, فَكُلُوهُ Eat it. Eat it. These are the conditions. طيب. So now, there's one misconception I want to just quickly mention. There's some people who um, they go to McDonald's or they go to KFC or they go to Wendy's or whatever it is and they go, they go to the chicken and they buy a burger and before they eat it, they say Bismillah. And they say, this is, this is halal for me. And if somebody offers me meat, I cannot say no. When a, when a non-Muslim, when my neighbor offers me meat, you know, I must not ask where it's from, I should just eat it. And they always quote this hadith mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. But the funny thing is, they don't even read the entire hadith. They read like two sentences of the hadith and they ignore the last line what Aisha radiallahu anha said. So Aisha radiallahu anha reports, the hadith is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. So that a group of people said to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa some people bring us meat and we do not know whether the name of Allah was pronounced over it or not. We do not know whether tasmiyah, whether the name of Allah was mentioned over it or not. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you should pronounce the name of Allah on it yourself and eat from it. Okay? That's all they read. These people, when they, when they quote this hadith, that's all they read. They say, this is sufficient for us to say bismillah over things or this is sufficient for us taking the non-believers' foods and eating it. We should say bismillah and eat it. Aisha <laughs> what does she say in the last line? She says, those people had embraced Islam recently. So those people who gave the meat, they were Muslim. They were Muslim. They did tasmiyah already. So their intention of tasmiyah was there. So it's not that, you know, we go and we just eat the people, eat whatever meat we want. This is the thing. When people, when we think about the meat of Ahlul Kitab, yeah, it's, it's halal for us to eat. But these two conditions also have to be met. Tasmiyah has to be there by Ahlul Kitab. Tasmiyah must be there. The flowing of blood must be there. There was one masala that came to us once. This one man was in Germany. He was in an area, in a village, where there were no Muslims. There was a whole bunch of Jewish people there. And there was a lot of kosher meat. So the question came and he asked, is, is it halal for me to eat this meat? So then we said, you know, it depends on what these people are slaughtering this meat on. So he went to these butchers and these butchers said that whenever we slaughter an animal, we say in the name of the God of Moses. We say, I slaughter this animal in the name of the God of Musa alayhi salam. Is this permissible for us, to, for me to eat? Yes, it is. The God of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is our Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The God of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we worship. So this condition of tasmiyah must be there for Ahlul Kitab as well. For a Christian or a Jew, when they slaughter, this condition must be there as well. Now for people to say that this country we live in, or America, or the UK, or whatever it is, this is considered the meat of Ahlul Kitab. This is, some of the, this is one of the most baseless things I've ever heard. We don't live in a country that's run by Christianity. Canada is not a country, especially the, the rules and regulations of slaughtering animals and so forth and whatever. It's not run by Christians, nor is it run by Jews. It's a sectarian country. It's not pushing any religious rhetoric. It's not pushing any religious ideology. It's not pushing any religious principles. So how can we say that all the meat in Canada or America or the UK is Ahlul Kitab? How is it Ahlul Kitab? The governments are not Ahlul Kitab. They're sectarian. Their laws are not based on any religion. So for us to say that, or for people to think that the meat of these countries is Ahlul Kitab, this is incorrect and impermissible. So these three conditions must be taken into consideration. So now before I end off, 
based on everything we just spoke about, we should ask ourselves, is the food we eat tayyib? Is the food we eat tayyib? Yes, it could be halal, that's fine, our food could be halal, but does it have this quality of tayyib? If, if we don't know, this is something we should try to work towards. The food we eat, the meat we buy, whatever it is, we should try to have aspects, we should try to make sure that it comes from a tayyib source. I always mention the example, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Nawawi would never eat from the fruits of Damascus. He would never eat from the fruits of Damascus, not the meat, leave the meat aside, the fruits. And when his students asked him, he said, in the marketplace, a lot of dhulm is being done. A lot of these people, they're cheating in the way they measure their fruits. I don't want to eat it because of this. This is, I mean, think about that for a second. This is in regards to their fruit and vegetables. Now, where do we stand with our meat? A lot of people, they're, they're very lax and easygoing when it comes to their meat. Oh, brother, it's halal, don't worry about it. You know, it's a matter of spirituality. It's a matter of our du'as even being accepted. We spoke about the hadith that, you know, when a person eats haram, when a person wears haram, when a person drinks haram, their du'as will never be accepted. So we have to be very careful in the source of our meat, in the source of our food, where it's coming from. And I mean, this hadith, and another, the second thing we have to, we have to ask ourselves is, are we doing or are we trying to get better in everything? Are we trying to get better at everything? This is a question we should ask because ihsan is what? Always striving to get better and to do better. Always trying to do things in a better fashion. Are we really trying to do this? If we're not, we should. In everything we do. I mean, today we spoke about animals, subhanAllah. We spoke about being good with, to animals. Think about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet والسلام, is commanding us to be good to animals. How, must, how good was, must we be to human beings now? How good must we be to our parents? How good must we be to our brothers and sisters? I mean, these are questions we should ask. I'm going to end off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ This... Uh, this, this ayah is, this, this is, this is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 195. He says, Strive towards excellence. Have ihsan in everything you do. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those people who strive towards excellence. And I mean, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us, what more do we need? Whose love do we need if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us? We should be striving for Allah's love. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all tawfiq to bring this quality of ihsan into our lives. Jazakumallahu khayra wa ahsan al jaza'a aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al-muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafoodur rahim.